All right, we are back here on the podcast, getting ready for New York Knicks basketball here in one of the most anticipated Knicks seasons in years. Second straight year, we've had a guest from Knicks Film School on the podcast. We had DJ Ace last year. This year, we got the great Chris Hersianen here on the podcast. Chris, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. And it's an exciting time to talk Knicks. Like you said, it's the most anticipated season in a while. I'm 22 years old. I think this is easily the most anticipated season of my lifetime with the first full season after, you know, trading for Carmelo probably being second yeah. um, and maybe third place being like the season that never was where the Knicks would have had Kyrie, Katie and Zion, uh, which gives you a sense of where this franchise has been at in the time that I have graced this planet with my presence um it's been pretty dull and miserable and gloomy for a lot of the time um because of self-inflicted wounds but now the team built they built right they built slow um and you're kind of seeing even with the new york yankees right now how the city of new york will band around a team that is willing to stare adversity in the face and say, nah, I trust our guys. Like, we've, we've got enough. We've got this. Yeah, that's for sure here. It's crazy how much has changed just one year because at the start of last season, we're sitting here talking about, is Emmanuel quickly get a contract extension? Can R.J. Barrett build on his playoffs here? Is Julius Randle clutch? And now, basically, a year later, the whole roster is basically turned over here with a bunch of superstars in here. You've got Bridges. You've got Cat. You've got OG and OB here and extended, like, how crazy are you thinking about like how much they, they turned the roster over in the span of like one season? Yeah, Grimes is gone, Toppin is gone, Quickly is gone, Barrett is gone, Randall is gone, DiVincenzo is gone. Hartenstein is gone. Yep. Sit with that for a second, right? Like Nick's discourse used to be about how do you rank our young players? IQ. RJ Grimes Obi and the Knicks discourse used to be you know which young player would you want to keep the most and in eight months Leon Rose turned RJ and quick into OG and the rest is history yeah it's it's wild to think about all that stuff here especially like all this feels like it's also possible here because they had on the rare free agency superstar that was unheralded in Jalen Brunson here. And Jalen Brunson now does it makes a massive favor here. He takes less money on the extension. He could have held out a year for a super max, chooses, you know what? I'm gonna take the less you allow them to build around me here. We know that if the Knicks win a title, Jalen Brunson will be a statue outside of MSG within like five years. So uh what do you think of the importance of Brunson has been to this building effort and like his chances now potentially win an MVP this season? Well, I think the fact that it's not out of the question for a Nick to win an MVP, uh, and this is going into the season before uh, you know a single tip off has has happened, um, is is the proof. Like, like there's the there's the pudding, right? There's the pudding with the proof in it that the team has done a full turnaround. They are a contender. They are whatever you want to call it. That said, for Brunson, you know he's talked about, and it's been reported how. He's researched like what the guy should do. And he's looked at Tom Brady and these different athletes who took pay cuts, Dirk Nowitzki. And like that is very loud because he said something at media day this year. He said, I I'm the leader of this team. I'm excited to lead this team. And if you remember the not shy, but reserved guy who came from Dallas, the first $100 million deal given out to a non-career all-star from another team. And he, he said right away, I'm not your savior. I am not coming to save this franchise. But he did just that. And it, it, much like in the NFL where you can be the worst franchise in the history of whenever, but if you hit on a franchise quarterback, <laughs> CJ Stroud, <laughs> your whole franchise turns around in less than a year like can you name me a real top 10 level player in recent memory that switched teams via free agency and not in some machination of a sign and trade or a trade in general or loudly demanding out 
um <laughs> and then leading to a trade like the Knicks they I don't want to say they got lucky because they created this luck but you know, once they hired Leon Rose, like Brunson going to New York at some point was a thing. Like it was, you know, we're being worked on behind the scenes. And then he comes to New York and he's like a top 30 NBA player. And the Knicks are like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this went as well as it possibly could have. And then that offseason, the Knicks went, oh, wait, this guy's about to be like a lot better. Like we we just realized that he's not exploiting the three-point skill that he has to the extent that he could be. We're going to have him take a bunch more threes, and you're going to poop your pants at how crazy of a superstar he is. And then he comes out, and he's like a top-10 player. So that happening in free agency for the Knicks left them draft capital. That draft capital was used to overpay in price for Mikhail Bridges. Why were they able to do that? because they turned Barrett quickly in a second round pick into Ananobi, who doesn't need the ball in his hands, who perfectly complimented Brunson and Randall. They took Randall and DiVincenzo, two players that they did not trade for. They just signed with cap space and then extended in the case of Randall. They took one measly first round pick and Keita Bates Diop and turned that into their final infinity stone of Carl Anthony town. So, For the New York Knicks, it's all fitting, right? They can overpay in picks for Mikhail because they didn't give up any picks for Ananobi. And they didn't give up more than one protected first-round pick for Towns because they stuck by Randall and extended him when everyone wanted him gone. They let Obi walk to the chagrin of prospect huggers everywhere and enjoyers of fun, fast-paced basketball (laughs) to get DiVincenzo. Um, They got railed for the DiVincenzo signing. They got railed for the Brunson signing. Oh, you you traded for Josh Hart, and now you have to pay him $18 million a year. You're screwed. These are all things that were actually said, like, unironically. The Knicks just said, we know what we're doing. We have a plan. Just because we don't tell you the plan doesn't mean there isn't a plan. It's actually tampering if we tell you the plan. Watch this. So, like... For me, this all comes back to Brunson. This is all possible because of Brunson. And the same way that the Knicks got a superstar in a different way than most teams and gave up more picks than any other team would have for Bridges because they got Ananobi for no picks. Like, Isn't that kind of in sync with how the team is going to work on the court, right? Hart, not really a shooter, but the center might be the best shooter on the court. The center, not really a post player, but the point guard, he might have the best post game on the floor. And the point guard, well, he's not hes not much of a defender. But Mikhail Bridges and OG Ananobi, they can help out with that. Carl Anthony Towns, he's not much of a rim protector, but OG is. Like, OG was guarding Embiid in the playoffs in small ball five. So these, these kind of idiosyncrasies, they all fit, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful. It's all domino effect from Brunson. I'm going to touch on the individual pieces of this situation here, starting with the uh... – the Cal Bridges trade, which seeing the Knicks and Nets make a trade feels like hell froze over back in the spring when it happened. I remember everybody's freaking out and like, oh, sorry, oh my God, this actually happened. They're saying, oh, you can't give up four firsts for Cal Bridges. They gave up uh, a bunch of uh, salary filler and Bojan Bogdanovic and a bunch of crazy stuff. And we had the very brief four Nova Nick era. Now it's down to three. But like in terms of roster fit, he feels like he's the perfect kind of guy to sort of complement what you have going on here with the existing pieces. So, like, that was a bet. And I guess the Towns move was, too. But it was a bet on Brunson being enough, right? Like, let's talk about the Boston Celtics, who, because of how much they love offensive and defensive EPM, tend to acquire somewhat similar player profiles to the New York Knicks. It's it's two different ways to, you know, skin the cat, but um, they both went to the same school of grooming animals i don't know what that business is called but you get what you get what i'm trying to say um listen the celtics is jason tatum someone who any like the average nba pundit would say like i want to start my franchise with him over anyone else maybe a couple years ago when he was 17 for the fourth year straight but uh nowadays yeah, there's sexier names out there. Yeah, Luca, Wemby, Jokic, Giannis, a little Shea Gilgis. Like, 
there's a lot of options out there that people would take over Tatum. The thing is, Tatum just won a championship as the best player on his team. And he didn't even win finals MVP. But the city of Boston doesn't care because their hands are a little heavier. They lift them up. That ring finger has a little weight on it. Yep. And uh, for the New York Knicks, you know, a lot of people used to comp this team. RJ's Tayshawn Prince. Brunson is Chauncey Billups. Uh, maybe like Randall is Wallace. You know, like the, the, people tried to liken this team to the Pistons championship squad because they didn't have a traditional sexy slam cover superstar. And it didn't matter. And no one cared because they won it all. For Mikhail Bridges, that trade is a bet on Brunson being good enough to be the best player on a championship team and saying, listen, a lot of teams in the league have 9 out of 10 player, 8.9 out of 10 player, 7.5 out of 10 player, and then 7, 7 out of 10 role players, right? The Knicks are like, what if we just have like 5 nine out of tens in the starting line <laughs> like they they're doing this a little differently and it reminds me of and I, I, i'm not doing player comps this is not a direct <laughs> comparison but there's this guy uh named red and he used to talk about how his teams won championships in the 70s because everyone played like they weren't better than the next guy clyde frazier willis reed dave debusher phil jacks like those teams played like there was no best player. Like everyone played like they were the second best player on the team. And it was awesome. And that's kind of how these Knicks work. Um, obviously, the roles are a little more defined. The NBA is a little more specialized. There is a three-point line. Uh, things are a little different now. Um, but Clyde's still around. Ewing's around now. The, the Knicks have have blended past and present so well. And I do think that Mikhail Bridges is an integral part of that. The fact that he can scale up, scale down in usage. He's fine if you win and he has six points and two assists and three rebounds yeah. because you won and he did his job. Um, it's clear that between Bridges and Ananobi, the Knicks are acknowledging Boston. They're giving them a salute. They're saying, we know what you've got but we've got two hulks. So like, um, we'll see, we'll see how it all goes. But bridges to me, like you can talk about him like this seamless fit because that's who he is. Yeah. That makes some sense here. The fit for Carl Anthony Towns did not seem as like seamless at first when they make this trade. There's another bomb that came at the end of September right before training camp here. Randall goes, you figured that was happening sooner or later. Again, the fact that he probably didn't want to extend the price Knicks wanted here. Don DiVincenzo goes, made a little bad blood with Rick Brunson, some stuff going on. We saw in the pregame match, preseason matchup here. But Towns has always been fascinating. The Knicks have been linked to him for a while, and he doesn't really fit the typical, like, Thibodeau, like, must defend at an all-tier level here. I know they, that he coached in Minnesota for a bit. Towns has the ability, doesn't always show it. But in terms of, you know, spacing the floor, shooting, creating space for Brunson in the middle, it's a fit that way. It's interesting to see how Towns will work compared to what they got for him. Towns, man, I, I called him the final infinity stone, and it's kind of perfect because his floor spacing is the ultimate acknowledgement of Jalen Brunson and his bread and butter. Um, and so when you have Towns out there spacing the floor, Brunson can drive the lane much easier. Hart can bulldoze his way to the restricted area much easier. The Knicks don't demand post game from their centers. They like rim running and rebounding and rim protection and dunks. Um, high percentage shot, four slow percentage shots on defense, you're good in their book. That said, Carl Anthony Towns, like you mentioned, a very clear deviation from that. So clearly not a Thibodeau style center that the two of them literally had a falling out. Like, they worked for the same employer and had a falling out um, in Minnesota. But years back, Tibbs was like, nah, I'd love to have Carl back on my team. Like, whatever. Like, you could tell the Knicks have been, you know, laying the foundation for this for a while. And I think it should be a really positive sign to Nick fans that Cat didn't like Tibbs at first. Once he spent time away from Tibbs, 
grew to appreciate him and was like, you know what? He's a crazy bastard, but he wants to win. And so do I. And I can get behind that. So I think Cat will be worth it for them. I think he will be worth Randall and DiVincenzo. Um, I mean, you want to think in the most literal terms possible. We're in a league where the number of players you can have on your roster is limited. We're in a league where you can only play five players at a time. So I'm inclined when a team trades two players for one, especially when both fan bases say they lost the trade, (laughs) um, that it's going to be a good deal. And I think this could work out nicely for the Wolves too, but I I get the sense that there's something else coming. I don't know if it's going to be flipping Randall at the deadline or next offseason in a sign-in trade, Um, but it doesn't feel like that's their plan. Like it feels like their front court plan is Nas Reed and Gobert. I don't know where Randall, the Randall piece fits in there. Yeah, that's a Minnesota problem though. The Knicks have a different problem with the center. Obviously, we heard right for training camp, right for this trade that Mills Robinson's uh surgery is not taking very well to the ankle. He needs time to get fully healthy. Talking December, January, see him again. And obviously. Towns is brought to sort of cover up the absence. So I do wonder here, like when he does eventually get back here, like how do you think that this works with him in the middle and Towns at the four? Because obviously they tried the two big thing in the past. It hasn't always gone smoothly, but like how do you feel Robinson fits once he returns? I think the Robinson fit, if he returns and, and plays for the Knicks this season, is going to be good. Um, Carl Anthony Towns is a really strong changeup pitch, but Robinson is that Knicks identity fastball. And what's cool is we have proof of concept from the Twin Cities that Towns and Gobert could play together. So you would think, all right, if the Knicks want to go big, they can go Brunson, Bridges, Ananobi, Towns, Robinson. If they want to go a little in between, but big down low, Brunson, Hart, Bridges or Ananobi, Towns and Robinson. Um, If they want to go small, they can go Brunson, Bridges, Hart, Ananobi, Achua, you know? Like, they've got some different looks up their sleeve. Um, And I think the Mitchell Robinson fit is an important one of those looks uh, I think if the team does move him, it's got to be for someone who allows you to stay versatile in terms of your scheme. I think the NBA at large nowadays is about winning closeouts, and that's a very packed statement, winning closeouts. Well, to get closed out on, you have to be able to shoot, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole thing of its own. I think the playoffs are about winning closeouts and about scheme versatility. Did Boston play five out every single possession last year? No. But in the finals, they won playing five out because it's what worked against Derek Lively in the Mavericks defense. They baited Lively out, and Tatum or Brown had a runway to the rim every time. If Boston, if Dallas made the right adjustments, which I was screaming, calling for them to do during the series, probably wouldn't have mattered because Boston would have just found a different way to slice and dice them. Um all right, you're going to drop lively. Well, we've got five shooters on the floor. Have fun with that. Um, so, like, the Knicks have that versatility now. Um, with Robinson in the picture, it allows them to say, yeah, we've got a real, real rim protector. Porzingis is a better defender than Towns, and so the Celtics don't need that archetype. They're fine with someone worse than Robinson, like Xavier Tillman Sr., who's a good player. Yeah, yeah, that makes some sense here. And uh, you mentioned some of the bench guys are a bit here. Last year, one of Nick's strengths was their depth and how, especially when everybody was healthy, oh, we can roll 10 deep and just wear everybody down. Then all the injuries took it away, and then they just moved off from all the depth guys in trades in the offseason. So now the bench is a little thin. Obviously, you got Deuce McBride still there. They lost Presh to Chua to the hamstring for two to four weeks. So we'll see what happens there. You have Jericho Sins, Mikey getting some minutes. Have some have to figure out still that last roster at machinations here. Like, like who, like how many guys really fit that rotation for Thibodeau right now? Because like that seems to be like he likes to go nine deep, but like I know it's hard to figure out who the guys are after Deuce at this point. I'll uh ah, 
you're backing <laughs> me and you're backing me into a corner where I have to release my bold prediction for the opening night uh, tomorrow night. We're recording Monday. So Tuesday, tomorrow, first game of the season. I think off the bench, you will see Cameron Payne. I think you will see Deuce McBride. I think you will see Jericho Sims. Um, and I think you'll see Pacom Dottier. I think he's cracking the rotation. Ah, I didn't say all that, <laughs> but I do think on opening night, he'll be there. <laughs> he, he might play. If you remember, and you honestly, hopefully, you don't, but I don't have a life, so I do. Tibbs played Jericho Sims on a two way deal opening yep. night against guess who? Austin, the Boston Celtics. Like, he's done this before. Um, desperate times call for desperate measures, my friend. And the 19 year old Pacom Dadier getting burn in a lineup that was Brunson, Hart. I don't know, it was like Brunson, Hart, Bridges, Dadier, Towns, something like that. Yeah. But it was four starters and Pacom. That that's not like you saw that and you're like, oh, they're trying this out because this might act like this might this might make it to the regular season. Um I, again, once Achua is back, I don't think Pacom Dadier will be playing unless something has gone terribly wrong and they're down 40, or something has gone terribly right and they're up 40. Yeah. Um but I think he plays opening night, and I think that's who you're going to see, you know, get a little run early. It's funny because Tyler Kolek is twice as NBA ready as Pacom Dadie is, but this is how life works. It's not just in my career on 2K that someone gets injured and you get thrust into your first career playing time. Like, this is life, and, you know, the Knicks, they'll always tell you injuries are part of the game. They're not an excuse for anything. You've got to be ready. Last year... You talked about all the injuries they faced. Bogdanovich, Hart, Brunson, Ananobi, Robinson, Hartenstein. I, Randall, Randall. Um, so lots of injuries for the Knicks last year. And that's something they're clearly trying to be a little more ready for this year. Um, but then their third string unit of Payne, Kolek, Bates, Diop, you know, like Sims, like, that kind of became the second string really quick once they made these these two trades this offseason. So, yeah, I think you'll see a, a different rotation a couple times. Wait for the 20-game mark. 20 games into the season, Tom Thibodeau usually makes a change or doesn't to the rotation, and then that's kind of what he goes with for the rest of the year. All right, so keep an eye on that one here. My last question here is obviously – we mentioned it a little while ago here. Like the Knicks sort of like built this roster to combat the Boston Celtics. They have the big wings now, defend Tatum and Brown. They have they are basically they're big in towns to combat Porzingis. They have Robinson coming back to help be the rim protector. They have Brunson. They have obviously Josh Hart. Like they have the kind of six strong guys that the Celtics like to do here. Do you think they have enough to take the Celtics on? It's probably their biggest threat to getting to the NBA finals right now. They damn near did last year, yeah. right? You you remember that game in uh, the regular season? Obviously, it's not a playoff environment, but Celtics were fully healthy. Knicks were not. And New York just won. Like, they just pulled it out and won. Um, I do think this Knicks team can tango with Boston. Now, obviously, we've seen firsthand – from the Denver Nuggets infamous starting five of the last several seasons that continuity and stability can really help a lineup gel and develop synergy that allows them to play greater than the sum of their parts. However, we might finally have discovered like a loophole to that in the sense that, well, one of the new faces is Mikhail Bridges. He's pretty unless he suffers from like brutal memory loss, which I wouldn't blame him. Um, I think he knows what it's like to play with, with a player that plays like Jalen Brunson. And I think he knows what it's like to play with a player that plays like Josh Hart because he played with Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart. Yeah. And that storyline has been talked about ad nauseum, but like 
not the important part. Like everyone's talking about, oh, the Nova Knicks, oh, the Villanova Knicks, oh, they're all back. This is going to be so sweet. This has never happened before. Oh, now Dante's gone. No, the Nova Knicks. Like I remember asking Brunson and Hart when they first traded for Josh being like, do y'all feel like there's like a little bit of like telekinesis when you guys play? Because you guys just got on the same team in the NBA for the first time and it's two games in and you're like communicating non-verbally and every like it's going really smoothly. Um, so I do think the Knicks in the Bridges edition and how much of a glue guy he is. And then Towns is easy going. Like if you haven't watched the latest roommates show, you really should um, because you get a nice glimpse into what Carl Towns is like around Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart. They're all being nice to each other. It's cordial. They're trying to show the world that they're like new teammates and getting along. There's got to be a little thought of that in the back of their mind. Right. But overall, not to like fake being a behavioral scientist, but I thought it was very genuine, friendly interaction. Like, you know, you, you start work or some something somewhere and like within like two weeks, you've got one or two people that like you can talk about the boss behind their back and vent. Even if you love your boss, everyone's got to vent sometimes. It feels like they've kind of already developed that vibe. Like those guys are going to support Tibbs and listen to Tibbs behind the scenes. They'll laugh about it because that's how you get through situations is you learn how to laugh about them. I think they'll be laughing together this season. Um, I, I don't see there being a rift at all in this in this group, despite the unceremonious exit of Dante DiVincenzo. Um, but I think Dante is just a competitive player and a competitive person, and that's brought out of him by himself every night when he steps on the court. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch the Knicks this season, see how far they can get. Chris, thanks for all the time. Really appreciate it. People, I'll follow you on social media. How can I do that? You can go look up my name, K R I S space P U R, and hopefully it'll autofill from there. Chris Percy Iden. I'm on Twitter. I do NBA reporting independently. Um, I'm on TikTok. I just shoot the shit about NBA stuff because that's what I do in my head all day anyway. So why not share it with you guys? Um, and also, you can look on all things NBA from A to Z. Uh, the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your shows. It's my show with ballislife.com. We just had on Kendra Andrews to preview some Western Conference teams. It was a lot of fun. Um, so go check out that show as well. I think just good ball talk. Um, and we try to keep it fun and, and lighthearted too. Mike, I loved being on the show. Thank you so much for having me.